Welcome to The Straight Stitch, a podcast about sewing and other fiber arts. This is episode six, and my name is Janet Zabo. I will be your guide as we explore all things sewing. It's been a more relaxing week this week than last week. I got to relax a little bit after the sale. Um, I taught a Bernina Serger Mastery class this week. I do that at one of the quilt stores here in town. It's a Bernina dealer. And I really enjoy that class because people come in with usually with brand new machines and a lot of times they're terrified of them. Um, So it's my goal that by the end of the class, they are no longer terrified of those machines and they feel confident enough to go home and start a project. So one of my students in this week's class said that she was going to go home and make two dozen pairs of flannel pajama pants for her family for Christmas. So I thought that was a pretty cool idea. On Wednesday, I hemmed a bridesmaid's dress for a friend of mine from church. She's going to be in a wedding in two weeks and needed to have her dress shortened by about two and a half inches. So I did that for her. It was a bridesmaid's dress made from dark green stretch velvet. It has a skirt that overlaps in the front. So the best way to describe it is that the skirt is kind of a rectangle shape sewn at the waistband and overlapped. And after looking at it, I realized that the construction was fairly simple. The, um, The stretch green velvet skirt and the polyester lining fabric were sewn into a tube. And basically when the skirt was attached to the bodice, uh, the polyester lining was folded back against the wrong side of the stretch velvet and it was treated as one layer of fabric. So I was able to Um, work all the way around the circumference of the hem and pin up what I needed to and then I went and hemmed it on my cover stitch machine because the original hem had been done on a cover stitch machine and then I trimmed off very carefully with a pair of duckbill scissors the excess fabric above the cover stitch hem and that's not typically how I do my cover stitch hems but In this instance, it worked better than cutting off the fabric first and then folding up the hem. And I was really happy with the way it turned out, and I will get it back to her this week. I'm really sorry about my voice. I think my allergies are acting up this week. Um, So I will try to keep the coughing and the throat clearing to a minimum. The other project I've been working on this week is trying to find a pants pattern to teach at the quilt store in Spokane, Washington next month. Um, I had several people who were in my t-shirt class in August at that same store ask if I would come back and teach a pants class. I've taught the J. Lee Renee pants here in Kalispell. I've taught that class twice. And it's gone very well both times. The Renee pants um, are a cigarette style pant. And so they're very tight down to the ankle. And just knowing the students who are probably going to be in the class in Spokane, I didn't think that that was going to be the kind of pants that they wanted to make. So I've been looking for something with a little less fitted leg to it. And I also had a request from one of the students not to have pants that had a waistband with just a big chunk of elastic and a gathered waist um, because she didn't think that those were particularly flattering on her. I agree. I really like the waistband on the Jaylee Renee pants. It's a flat waistband that has elastic inside that's turned over and stitched down. But again, those pants have very tight legs. So I was looking for something sort of like the Renee pants, but with a wider leg. Someone suggested the Eleanor pants or Eleanor pants. I don't know how that's pronounced. I'm not French. 
and I'm really sorry if I'm butchering it. Um, those are also a Jaylee pattern. So I did buy that pattern. I had some black stretch cotton poplin that I had gotten at Joanne Fabrics on clearance. And I made those pants this week too, but I realized that they were not going to work very well for this class. When I'm choosing projects for a class, I have to take into account how much time we have, the skill level of the students, the machines that we have room to use. There are, there's a whole laundry list of things that I have to think about. And not every pattern is going to be suitable for every class that I want to teach. So the problem that I ran into with the Eleanor pants was that they have several components to them. So there's a back yoke, a back yoke, front pockets, and a lot of top stitching. Every time a piece is added or a seam is sewn, there are instructions to do two parallel rows of top stitching. So not only does the construction of these pants require a serger, it also requires a sewing machine. And the store where I'm going to be teaching has a very tiny classroom space. I know that we probably won't have room for all the students and for each of them to have a serger and a sewing machine or even for us to have just a couple of sewing machines in there for all the students to use. So that eliminated that pattern. I turned to a Palmer Pletch Butterick pattern, which um, if you know anything about Palmer Pletch, they release patterns in books that uh, deal with tissue fitting. And while the pattern had a lot of good fitting suggestions in it, and I thought it would be really great because it was only two pattern pieces and a piece of elastic for the waistband, I was reminded of a comment that my son-in-law's mother made to me a couple of weeks ago when she reminded me that sometimes patterns which have more than the usual number of seam lines in them, um, that gives opportunity for better fitting because you have more places where you can make adjustments. I cut out the Butterick pattern anyway and made up a quick muslin for myself and I realized that that pattern wasn't going to work for precisely that reason. There is one seam um, at the inseam. There's a, a crotch seam and an inseam and that's it. There is no side seam and when I got my muslin on, I realized that as with many pants patterns, the hips are enormous on me. So I figured if I was going to have problems fitting those pants to myself, I didn't want to try to have to help students fit those pants to themselves. And tissue fitting is probably my least favorite way to fit garments anyway. So I eliminated that pattern. I went back to a new look pattern. It's new look 6689. And I actually made, it's a top and a pair of yoga pants. And I actually made the top last year. It was a knot top with a knot at the waistband. And while I had cut out the pants pattern, I had never put the pants together. So I got out that pattern and I got out some black ponte. I usually have black ponte in my stash because it's so useful. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough black ponte to make these pants. I had enough for the pants. I didn't have enough to make the waistband. And the waistband is rather important. So I put the black ponte back in the stash and dug a little further and pulled out a length of fabric that I picked up, I think at the Walmart in Missoula because my friend Robin was with me when I bought this. It's a fabric that has two, um, two faces to it. So the outside feels kind of like Ponte, almost like a scuba fabric, but the inside of the fabric is a micro fleece. And if I could figure out who manufactures this and I could buy a bolt of it, I'd be very tempted. I got a three yard chunk at Walmart off the remnant rack and brought that home intending to do something just like yoga pants with it. 
and I decided that it would be the perfect fabric for this pattern. So I cut the pattern out after I spent 20 minutes or so comparing the rise to the J. Lee Renee pants because those fit me really, really well. I am, I have a lot of distance between my natural waist and my crotch. Um, I love high rise pants because I want them up near my natural waist. I was miserable when all that was being offered in the stores was low rise jeans because it felt like they were going to fall off of me. And comparing patterns is actually something that I do fairly frequently. I will take my tried and true patterns and I will compare them to something that I'm planning to cut out. And that helps me to see right away if I need to make any alterations. So I could tell by looking at the new look pattern compared to the Jaylee Renee pants that the rise was going to be plenty long once the waistband was attached. So I forged ahead and cut them out uh, surged them together. It took less than an hour to put the pants together and all that's left now to do is hem them. They fit me perfectly. I might on the next pair that I think I will make out of Ponte drop the front rise by about half an inch, but otherwise they fit great and I will probably be making more pairs of them, especially if I can find this double-sided fabric again. And I think that's the pattern that I'm going to use for the pants class in Spokane. It'll be easy for students to find Ponte fabric. Joanne Fabrics carries it. Hobby Lobby carries it. It's quick and e they're quick and easy to make and they can be done entirely on the serger, except for the hem. So that'll be a great choice for that class. I still have a couple of samples to make up for a cover stitch class that I'm teaching next month and I will hopefully get some time to work on those in the next week or so. Today I want to talk about sergers. Right now sergers are my favorite sewing machine. I lump everything under one heading so sewing machine, serger, cover stitch. Um, right now my sergers are my favorite machine so I thought it would be good to do a whole episode about sergers. I used to be terrified of sergers. I'm thinking back to about 10 years ago before I got my first serger and I thought I'm never going to be able to learn how to thread this thing. I have enough trouble with sewing machines. What am I going to do with a serger? But then I wanted to start making my own clothing and it seemed like a serger was going to become a necessary part of my arsenal of tools. So I did some research and looked at my budget and I settled on the Juki 654DE as my very first serger. That is a four thread serger. It was about $300 when I bought it 10 years ago. And for the first eight years that I used it, it did everything that I needed it to do and then some. I have since upgraded to a Bernina L860 and that machine when I purchased it had a list price of about $6,000. Um, that was a special treat to myself, but I still have the Juki and I still take the Juki to classes with me. It is a fine little machine. I would highly recommend it. You don't need to spend a whole lot of money to get started. And in between there, I also purchased a Juki Industrial Serger. It's an MO816 and it's a five thread serger. It's rather a beast, but I use it when I make canvas grocery bags and it does a great job. So let's talk a little bit about the history of sergers and how they differ from sewing machines. A man named Joseph Marrow is credited with patenting the first overlock machine in 1889. And you will often hear um, modern overlockers, even still today, referred to as Marrow machines. It's a name that has kind of stuck generically. Um, interestingly, oh, look at this. 
Wilcox and Gibbs, the sewing machine company, and the Merrow Machine Company were engaged in a lawsuit in 1905, and the Merrow Machine Company was awarded ownership and rights to the early mechanical development of the overlock machine. So there was some of that going on in the overlock world as well as in the sewing machine world. Overlock machines remained mostly industrial until the mid-60s, and apparently, according to a Baby Lock History website, and I'll put links to all of these so that you can go and read them for yourselves, but apparently, according to Baby Lock History, uh, two Japanese engineering engineers in the mid-60s went to their bosses and said, we think that we've come up with the plans for a small version of the industrial machine that could be marketed to the domestic sewing machine market. And they called it uh, the name Baby Lock because it was a baby version of the larger machines and lock for overlock. So that's how Baby Lock came to be known as a brand. Baby Lock has since been a pioneer in the overlock machine industry. They came up with, in 1997, the very first air threading machine. Um, and for those of you who have attempted and hopefully succeeded in threading a serger, air threading is a wonderful development. Manually threading a serger means you have to follow a particular threading path and use a pair of tweezers and sometimes stand on your head and stick your tongue out and the threads have to be threaded in a particular order. With the air threading machines there's a little vacuum system that actually sucks the thread in and threads the machine for you and you can thread the threads in any order you want. I teach a serger class that I call Serger 101 and it's for people who have a serger and are afraid to use it, have a serger and have never used it. Um, I get a lot of people in those classes who have pulled a serger out of the closet after 20 years or bring a serger to class that they picked up at a yard sale for $10 or bring a serger to class that they inherited from a cousin or a grandmother. Um, I have seen everything from the earliest uh, popular domestic sergers, the 1980s versions, the Burnett machines, everything all the way up to a lot of the more modern machines and even the newer air threaders. It's fascinating to me to be able to trace the development of the features that you find on modern sergers. So if you look at some of the early Burnett machines, they were only three threads. Um, and we'll talk about threading here in a minute. The earliest Burnett machines were only three thread machines. Um, if you wanted to do a rolled hem, you had to change the, the throat plate. Um, a lot of them didn't have easy ways to change the stitch width. Um, most of those early machines were limited to one or two stitch widths, usually somewhere in the five to six millimeter wide stitch range. With the addition of a second needle thread, now we had four thread machines um, and eventually even five thread machines, which had a three thread overlock and a two thread chain stitch. And my industrial Juki serger is a five thread machine. Similar to that setup, I can do a two thread chain stitch in conjunction with a three thread overlock, or I can use the three thread overlock by itself without the two thread chain stitch. Newer machines have a lot more capabilities now, and even the lower end machines are capable of uh, adjustments in stitch width, and differential feed, and they have integrated stitch fingers now so that um, the stitch finger can be retracted so you don't have to change the stitch plate in order to do a rolled hem. Um, most of them come with an assortment of presser feet that allow you to attach elastic or beads or cording. Um, 
the the serger has come a long way, especially I think in the last 10 or 12 years. But maybe you're asking yourself, what does a serger do that a sewing machine doesn't do? And that's a good question. A serger doesn't use bobbins. It does have needles, but it doesn't have bobbins. Instead, it has two loopers, usually referred to as the upper looper and the lower looper. And because of their position on the fabric, so the upper looper is going to be on top of the fabric and the lower looper will be on the bottom of the fabric. And the two loopers are intertwined at the edge of the fabric so that it almost looks as though the two loop threads are praying over the edge of the fabric and they are anchored in place by the needle thread. You only require one needle thread to anchor the loopers in place, but the four thread machines have two needle threads to add an additional seam stitch for safety. The fact that the looper threads cover the edge of the fabric means that an overlock or a serger stitch is perfect for protecting the edges of fabric and keeping them from raveling. So if you have a linen fabric or a tweed or something that has a tendency to unravel because the weave is loose, um, using a serger either to construct the garment or whatever you're making or to finish the edge of the fabric before you sew it on a sewing machine means that those threads are less likely to unravel. Depending on whether you have one needle in or two and depending on whether if you're only using one needle, if you have it in the left or right needle position, you can get different widths of, fa of stitches along the edge of the fabric. Um, you can get what's called a three thread wide stitch with the needle in the left hand position or a three thread narrow stitch with the needle in the right hand position. One of the things that tends to confuse people who are using sergers is the fact that there are twice as many threads to deal with. So on a sewing machine, you have an upper thread and a bobbin thread. And if the tension is off, it can be frustrating to tr try and figure out whether you need to adjust the top tension or the bobbin tension. On a serger, you have four threads. And so not only do you need to figure out what the needle threads are doing, you have to figure out what the looper threads are doing as well. And that can tend to throw people. Um, I will tell you that on my industrial serger, there are no numbers on my tension dials. So once I have them set, I rarely monkey around with them because I don't want to have to try and figure out where they were supposed to be set again. All of the new sergers, um, sergers for a long time have had number markings on the tension dials. Um, something that I thought was brilliant was someone came up with the idea of color coding the thread paths. So on a lot of machines, you will see that one of the loopers is blue, one of the, the other looper is red, one of the needle threads is green, and one of the needle threads is yellow. And that doesn't mean that those are the colors of threads you have to use. That just means that those are the color codes for the threading path to help you thread the machine. All sergers have a knife blade or a pair of knife blades. And the knife blade is what cuts off part of the fabric to create a smooth edge for the loopers to wrap around. There are stitches that uh, require the knife. There are stitches that it's better to disengage the knife. Um, those are some of the advanced techniques that you would do with sergers. But in most cases, you will be using the knife when you're serging. Another feature that came along fairly early in the development of the serger was differential feed. So unlike a sewing machine, which has one set of feed dogs, a serger has two sets of feed dogs. There's a back set of feed dogs and a front set of feed dogs. The back set of feed dogs are not adjustable. They move at the same rate, no matter what you're doing. The front set of feed dogs is adjustable and it's adjustable by changing the differential setting. And the differential setting um, is usually set for regular surging at neutral 
or sometimes one. But let's say you wanted to stretch out the edge of what you were serging. So if you've ever seen lettuce edges on little kids items or sometimes ladies t-shirts, the lettuce edge is a serger, a decorative serger technique, and that is achieved by setting the differential lower than normal so that the front set of feed dogs moves more slowly than the back set of feed dogs. By moving more slowly, it stretches the fabric out. This is usually done on knits because knits will stretch more than wovens. On a knit fabric, if you stretch the edge out and then pack as much thread into that edge as you possibly can, when that edge relaxes because of all that thread that's in there and because you stretched it while you were feeding it into the machine, it's going to roll. And that's how you create a lettuce edge. Let's say that you change the differential setting to the highest number. Now the front set of feed dogs is moving more quickly than the back set of feed dogs and it's in essence jamming the fabric into the machine. And what do you get when you move the fabric really quickly through the machine? You get gathers. So using the differential setting will allow you to either stretch out the edge and make it wavy or compress the edge and create gathers. Stitch width settings on the newer machines go all the way up to nine millimeters on my Bernina. My Juki only had a stitch width of a maximum of seven millimeters and you wouldn't think that that two millimeters would make that much of a difference. But when you're doing decorative stitching, sometimes it does. So most of the newer machines have a nine millimeter stitch width. The baby lock machines have a proprietary stitch called the wave stitch. And the wave stitch is created by changing the tension as the loopers go through the machine. So if you do that on a regular, in a regular pattern, um, and you use two different color threads in the loopers, then what you get is the loopers moving back and forth across the edge of the fabric in a wave pattern. Hence the name wave stitch. I am not going to tell you that one brand is better than another. I have a Bernina and I love it, but I also teach classes at the quilt store here that is the baby lock dealer and the baby lock machines are just as nice as the Bernina machines. The big difference that I see between the two major brands, Bernina and Baby Lock, is that Baby Lock has a tensioning system that they call automatic thread delivery. And what that means is that on some of the higher end machines, there actually aren't any tension dials. You cannot uh, individually tweak the tension settings because the machine, depending on the thickness of the thread that, it's, that is going through it, and the way the thread is, um, the path that the thread takes through the machine, the machine determines what the appropriate tension is. On the Berninas, you can actually fine tune the tension settings. Uh, you can let the machine kind of decide ahead of time what would be appropriate, but if there's a particular uh, technique that you're trying to achieve or you just want to fine tune the tension settings, the Bernina lets you get in there, kind of get under the hood and actually uh, adjust the tension settings. I liken it to the choice between driving a stick shift and driving an automatic. Some people really like to drive a stick shift because they like to be one with the car. And some people want to get in the car and not have to worry about anything. And so driving an automatic is their preference. It's similar with sergers. Some people want to be able to get under the hood and do all the tinkering, and some people just want to sit down and sew. As with sewing machines, I think it's important to try out a variety of different models, uh, figure out what features you're looking for, and go in and test some machines out. Ask for demonstrations, ask friends for references, um, I really don't have an issue with, I, truly, the only machine that I would never, ever, 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 ever recommend because 
even I have trouble threading it, which is saying something, is don't ever buy a white speedy lock if you see one at the thrift store. Um, I made the mistake of picking one up for a friend of mine and she finally gave up in frustration because she couldn't thread it so she gave it back to me and I got it threaded but it took me a long time and I would never pass that machine on to anyone. So there are machines out there that will cause you to gnash your teeth and scream and yell in frustration. Uh, just avoid that white speedy lock if you ever see one. I had a student show up at a class a couple of weeks ago with a Brother 925, I think was the model number. Um, and it was a joy to sew on. It was the e probably the easiest serger I've ever had to thread. It was clear, the threading paths were clear, the threading paths were easy to get to. You didn't have to contort yourself into a pretzel to figure out where the thread was supposed to go next. Um, so there are some good low-end inexpensive machines out there. If you're just learning how to surge or you're, you wonder if this is the right machine for you, uh, try out one of the low-end machines. I do want to mention that now you might, nowadays you might see what's called a combo machine. Uh, there are machines that are both overlock machines and cover stitch machines. And cover stitch machines are a bit beyond the scope of this episode, but I will tell you that they are a specialty machine that is relatively new to the domestic market, probably in the last 10 or 15 years. And they are used specifically for hemming knit fabrics, hemming knit garments. Um, they are also used in decorative ways. And when I do an episode on my cover stitch machine, I will talk about... Um, the different ways that a cover stitch machines can be used in the home sewing studio. A lot of uh, people can only afford to buy one machine and so they look at a combo machine as the solution to their situation and there's nothing wrong with that. The Bernina L890, uh, the m model that's just above the one that I have, is a combo machine. Um, Combo machines have gotten kind of a bad rap in the past because it can be difficult to switch from overlocking to uh, cover stitch. Um, on the Bernina, it does take a little fussing. You have to move the needles over and change some of the accessories, but um, it can be done. So if you only want one machine, you might look at a combo machine. Uh, if you know that you don't want a combo machine or you don't want to tie up your serger to do cover stitching, um, you probably should consider two separate machines. I have a serger and then I also have a Janome cover stitch. Sometimes sewists are so busy looking at the features of sergers that will allow them to construct garments that they forget that sergers also have a lot of decorative stitch possibilities. Um, that's one of the techniques that I've had a lot of fun exploring on my Bernina L860. Um, there are a lot of decorative threads out there. Most home sewists, uh, quilters will be familiar with the thread weight system of classifying threads. So a lot of quilters will use 50 weight thread for piecing. They might use a 40 weight thread for quilting. The lower the number in the thread weight system, the thicker the thread. So a 12 weight thread is going to be much, much thicker than a 100 weight thread. It's kind of counterintuitive, but once you start to think in those terms, um, you get oriented pretty quickly. So sergers are... Uh, sergers love 12 weight thread and I'm a Wonderfill educator so I love Wonderfill threads. They're a Canadian company. They have 36 different thread lines. They've got a variety of 12 weight threads, everything from one called spaghetti which is 100% cotton all the way up to uh, one called Glamour which is a rayon metallic 12 weight thread and you can do all sorts of fun decorative stitches um, on with your serger using those threads in the loopers and sometimes in the needles. 
One of my favorite techniques is to use a two or three thread flat lock stitch and a flat lock stitch opens. Um, it looks like a regular serger stitch when you're doing it, but then you pull the fabric gently and the threads lie flat on the surface of the fabric. That's why it's called a flat lock stitch. And when you do that with a decorative thread in the needle, you can then weave a quarter inch satin ribbon through the needle threads and get some really, really interesting decorative effects. The students at the store where I teach the Bernina classes, um, I've got a group of students there who really like to push the envelope and they will uh, suck up anything that I wanna teach them. So we have done classes on the different kinds of presser feet. We have done classes on um, inserting zippers with the piping foot, which is a really slick technique. We have done, we're gonna be doing a decorative cover stitch class using the cover stitch capabilities of their sergers. Um, anything that they find that they wanna learn, I will try to teach them. And so I've been having great fun um, learning the different techniques on my serger and trying out different patterns. I'd say that these days I spend more time with my serger than I do with my sewing machine um, just because I am having so much fun with it. In terms of maintenance, what sergers need most is to be vacuumed um, or have all of the lint that they create brushed out of them. Um, I like the little vacuum attachments that can get into the little tiny, teeny tiny crevices. My husband bought me a Milwaukee portable vacuum cleaner because he had one and I saw his and wanted it. So he bought me my own and that's what I use to clean out my serger. Um, it requires periodic oiling um, and you don't ever, 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 ever want to lick a thread and then put it through the air threading tubes because um, that's just asking for trouble. That's asking for moisture to build up in those threading tubes and uh, bacteria to grow in there and that's just gross. You don't want any of that. So you don't ever wanna lick the thread and then run it through the threading tubes. Um, usually machines come with some kind of a really fine wire for cleaning out the threading tubes if they happen to get some lint in them. But that's really the, the basic maintenance that you need to do on your serger. Just keep it clean. Um, don't ever, I tell my students, if I ever see them sewing with pins around their sergers, um, they're going to get a lecture from me because pins and sergers do not mix. It's bad enough when people run over pins with their sewing machines. You, you run the risk of throwing your, your machine out of time. If you do that, if you hit a pin with your sewing machine, if you hit a pin with your serger, you're probably gonna nick the knife and then your knife isn't gonna work properly and you're going to be sad. Um, I like to use the little tiny wonder clips, uh, especially for garment sewing because they're not very heavy and they're brightly colored so you see them, you won't ever run the risk of running one of them through your knife. Um, just pins and serger knives don't mix. I think that about covers it for sergers. If you have any questions on anything that I forgot to cover, um, please let me know. And great news, I found out yesterday morning that the podcast is finally listed on, on iTunes. Uh, there was a small glitch in my RSS feed that I submitted to Apple to have the podcast listed. And until I tracked that down, it wasn't going through properly, but that's been sorted. And the podcast is now listed on iTunes. If you would please go over there and leave a review, that would be great. It will help other people find me. Um, I would love to hear your questions and comments. You can also go to the episode page, which is at thestraightstitchpodcast.com or you can go to my website which is janetzabo.com and either of those 
addresses will get you to the podcast. They'll also get you to my blog where I write two or three times a week about what's happening here in Montana. Not always related to sewing. Sometimes it's related to other things. Um, but you might want to check that out too if you haven't looked at it already. Next week's podcast might be delayed by a few days because I will be traveling. I am heading to the Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, Tennessee to do demonstrations on spinning, knitting, and sewing. So I will be there over the weekend. Um, I may also be on some government watch list by now because I am a presenter at the Self-Reliance Festival. And if you think I'm joking, um, maybe you and I should sit down and have a little discussion over a cup of coffee because in our current climate, that's not that far-fetched. Um, but I will be at Self-Reliance Festival. If you're anywhere within driving distance of Camden, Tennessee, come on out. You can still get tickets. Um, I will be in the garage demonstrating and I'd love it if you came up and said hi. So until then, I hope you have a great week and I hope you get to go sew something.